As you may remember from the last video, Arthur had quite a shock to his system. He not only learned that the woman he'd been sleeping with was his own half-sister, but also of his royal lineage, that his parents were the former King Uther Pendragon and the Queen Igraine. This revelation came about after one of Merlin's typical games, where he pretends to be someone else, only to reveal himself at the last moment so as to legitimise his words. Once he tells Arthur of these two life-altering revelations, Arthur speeds home to confront the Queen Igraine about her being his mother. Before we get stuck in though, a quick message from today's sponsor, NordVPN. A VPN stands for a virtual private network, and is a service offered by NordVPN that would encrypt your internet activity and also protect your identity when you're online. With so much of our sensitive information now stored online, from bank details to home addresses, internet security is a must-have for any browser of the web. NordVPN will ensure that all of your internet usage is redirected through a specially configured remote server, which will see your IP address hidden and encrypt all the data you send and receive. This means that your data will be unreadable to any would-be hackers. So there's no need to worry about connecting to the Wi-Fi at the airport or at your local coffee shop. Because with NordVPN, your passwords, banking details, credit card numbers, and other private details will all be encrypted. Even if some super cyber hacker was able to intercept this data, they wouldn't be able to make sense of any of it. You'll also be protected against your own internet service provider, who has access to view everything that you do online. In fact, they may even sell this data onto advertisers, government agencies, and other third parties. With NordVPN, however, you can rest at ease knowing that your data is safe from prying eyes. As if that wasn't great enough, NordVPN can also make your IP address appear like you're somewhere else from around the world. With over 5,000 servers worldwide, NordVPN gives you the ability to manipulate your IP address to appear in a completely different country which is great if you're in an area where content is region locked or restricted, or if you're away from home and can't access your favourite shows because of country specific restrictions. With a simple click, you can assimilate your IP address into another country, allowing you to access the full scope of the internet as it should be. NordVPN is available through both iOS and Android platforms and is totally affordable with my 70% off a 3 year plan link. Just go to nordvpn.com slash the legend and use the discount code legends to receive an extra month absolutely free. Be quick though, as this month is the final sale of the three year plan. So this is your last chance to nab this great bargain. Remember, without a VPN, your connection is fully open and you may be vulnerable to strangers having access to your data. Is this really a risk you can take? Get peace of mind knowing that your data is encrypted and your IP address is hidden and enjoy the benefit of being able to bypass country specific content with NordVPN. Now you may also remember the circumstances of a brain giving Arthur up as a child and how she didn't really have much of a choice. After Uther Pendragon had impersonated her then husband, the Duke of Tintagil, courtesy of a spell by Merlin, Uther seduced Igraine. As payment for this spell, Merlin demanded the child which Uther conceived under the guise of Igraine's husband, to which Uther couldn't care less about. When Igraine's husband died and she ended up marrying Uther anyway, he reveals to her that the man she had slept with that one night wasn't her husband, but actually him, and that the child she now carries is his, but that she can't even keep it because he'd already promised it to Merlin. Igraine isn't even given a moment to protest. The baby is ripped away from her arms and given to Merlin, and we do not hear from her again. So it comes as great surprise that when Arthur, as a grown man, now confronts Igraine, that his trusty knight Sir Ulfius goes on the attack against her. He says to her in the front of the entire court, Ye are the falsest lady of the world, and the most traitorous unto the king's person. Where this outburst comes from is not known, nor is it even justified. Sir Orpheus is likely getting at the fact that Igraine had kept her motherhood to Arthur a secret, but this is hardly her fault. In fact, after Arthur is given to Sir Ector to be raised, it's pretty much treated as the greatest secret in the realm. Igraine couldn't go about tooting that Arthur was her son, 
because this would put the boy in danger, in a time where there was no king after Uther's death. Furthermore, it's likely that Merlin had instructed her to keep her mouth shut, and who would dare defy that psychopath? Arthur recognises that Orpheus is speaking out of line, and pretty much tells him to watch his mouth. But Orpheus goes on to accuse Igraine of not only being the cause of damage for Arthur, but also the cause of the great war that he'd been in. Because if she just told everyone that Arthur was her son, then that would have been enough to determine him as the true heir to the throne. In a way, he kind of has a point. Arthur wouldn't have needed to have proven himself with the sword and the stone, and wouldn't have had to fight all the other knights to justify his kingship. As the biological son of Igraine, he would have automatically become king without a single drop of blood being shed. But again, this is all Merlin's fault really, and Igraine's comeback to Orpheus' bold claims pretty much echoes this. She tells Arthur that she is a woman, and that she could not fight because of it. As you can see, Le Mort de Arthur is certainly a product of its time, by the implication here that as a woman, she did not have the right to challenge her husband, nor even Merlin, and that the choice of surrendering Arthur without a word was made for her. She continues that if she were to make a scene, she would have been dishonoured, and in reality, she probably wouldn't have been taken seriously anyway. Furthermore, she also details exactly what happened between her and Uther, in that Uther pretended to be her husband by a spell performed by Merlin, and that Merlin orchestrated the whole thing, from the technical rape of her by Uther Pendragon, to the selling of Arthur onto Sir Ector. In front of the whole court, she baits Merlin out as the scheming, manipulative little toad that he is. She also goes on to say that because Arthur was taken from her as soon as she gave birth to him, she had no idea what he looked like, nor how he'd look like when he pulled the sword from the stone. She couldn't have known it was her son, and in actuality, we aren't told if Igraine was even privy to the fact that Sir Ector was raising him. The only people who definitely knew of this was Uther, Ector, and of course, Merlin. After having heard this, Sir Orpheus concedes, and finally, someone turns on Merlin. Sir Orpheus declares, Merlin is more to blame than ye. But annoyingly, no one does anything to Merlin. In fact, Merlin is immediately able to segue back into the fold of the conversation, as if the shade just thrown at him didn't happen at all. He takes Arthur by the hand and presents him to a grain, ignoring the fact that he'd just been ousted as a grand manipulator and once more adopting the role as Arthur's guide. He begins to tell Arthur of the exact details of his birth, and how he ended up in Sir Ector's household, and that actually, this was all Uther's idea. Even though we all know it wasn't Uther's idea, because Uther didn't care, he just wanted to smash and dash. Anyway, after all of this, Arthur embraces his mother, and the two begin to cry in each other's arms, at having been reunited. Either that, or crying because Merlin gets off once again by being a pathological liar, and that neither of them can do anything about it. With that out of the way, we now turn our attention to the namesake of today's episode, Grifflet. The scene opens with a squire leading a wounded knight into Arthur's presence, a knight who had been duffed up by another knight in the woods. In fact, this knight, whose name was Sir Miles, was beaten up so badly that he actually dies of his wounds. There is some outcry over this amongst Arthur's court, and the knight in the woods who had done the beating becomes instantly vilified. It is here that Grifflet is introduced, a mere squire, who you might say has some illusions of grandeur. Seeking to revenge this knight's demise, Grifflet the squire begs Arthur to make him a knight, so that he might go to the woods and take vengeance on the knight in question. But Arthur is hesitant to give Grifflet such an honour, or such a burden. He believes that Grifflet is too young to be a knight, and far too wet behind the ears to go about charging into the woods to apprehend this knight especially considering the condition of Sir Miles, who had been roughed up pretty badly. Interestingly, even Merlin echoes Arthur's hesitancy, as he tells Arthur that it would be a pity if Grifflet met his peril at the hands of this knight in the woods, because Grifflet would one day become a great knight himself, and one who would be loyal to Arthur. Merlin also explains that this knight in the woods is also one of the strongest and fiercest knights in the world, and that if Grifflet goes to fight him, 
he probably won't be coming back. But shockingly, Arthur actually makes his own decision for once and goes ahead and makes Griffler a knight. He gives Griffler his blessing for him to go and fight the knight in the woods and even goes as far as to tell him that this will serve as payment for making him a knight in the first place. By this, Griffler has no choice but to serve his king and now sees it as not only his desire to avenge Sir Miles but also his duty to abide by his king's orders. So Griffler arms himself to the teeth grabs a horse and makes his way into the woods until he comes across a fountain. There he spies a rich pavilion and there under a cloth he finds a strong looking horse, that which belongs to the elusive knight. Here he also notices that one of the trees has a distinct looking shield strapped around the bog and we are told that Grifflet struck the shield, almost like he was ringing the doorbell of the knight's residence. With this, the knight emerges from his pavilion and demands to know why Griffler has done such a thing. I mean, there he was minding his own business, probably having a nap, and then this twerp comes along and starts knocking his stuff over. You know, I'd be pretty pissed off too if I was him. Grifflet puffs out his chest and tells the knight that he is here to fight him because of what he had done to Sir Miles and because this is now his mission, as decreed by the king. The knight recognises Grifflet's youth, however, and tells him to walk away, for he is merely a boy and could not withstand the beating that he would give him. But Grifflet is stubborn and he rushes the knight in an attempt to win his honour and avenge Sir Miles. Of course, as you might have guessed, this doesn't go too well for him. Mallory tells us that the knight turns Grifflet's spear into splinters and that he smites Grifflet through his shield, breaks apart his armour and knocks him off his horse. But this mysterious knight shudders at the sight of the defeated Grifflet lying still on the ground. He fears that he may have killed the boy and so stuffs him back on his horse and sends the horse back the way it came in hopes that the boy will find safe passage and sanctuary. Mallory tells us that the knight actually pays Grifflet some respect, noting that if he was able to pull through his injuries then one day he will make a most valiant knight for it took courage to face him and would take even more bones to live through such a beating. We are told that Grifflet does indeed make it back to Arthur's court, though he truly does look half dead. The court are quick to receive him and he is seen to by the healers where he is nursed back to health by leeches. Whilst he is healing, Grifflet would have a long time to think about his folly and how he'd rushed headfirst into such an encounter. He would no doubt beat himself up over having been defeated so easily, but there would also have been relief that he was actually able to survive the encounter. Whilst his pride was shattered, at least he was able to live to fight another day. And fight he would. In some variations of the tale, most notably by Howard Pyle in the story of King Arthur and his knights, this elusive knight that dishes out the most horrendous beatings is referred to as the Sable Knight and we'll be seeing how this story plays out here in Le Mort the Arthur in the next episode, as well as revealing just who he actually is. Whilst Griffler had little luck against the Sable Knight of the Woods, we'll see how Arthur fares as he gets ready to meet this notorious knight for himself. As always guys, if you've enjoyed today's video, then don't forget to give it a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe. Until the next time.